I could have swore we had prayer time for, for offering, but my fault, my fault. Good to be with you this morning. My name is Brad Alvin. I am the senior pastor here at El Camino. If you're new with us, welcome to you. If you're watching online, as always, welcome to you. Ma uh, Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20 is where we're going to be camped out this morning. And worship team, you guys nailed it this morning. Amen? Yeah. Um. I, it takes me back to mission trips, back to campaigners with Young Life, back to church, back to youth group. Thank you so much. When Haas came to me a few weeks ago, he's like, hey, we're going to do a, a 90s week. And I'm like, really? And I, I, we talked about it. I'm like, okay, let's do it. And well, well done. So um, next thing really quick before we get to the message is this. Um, I wanted to say again, right after um, this service down in the FAC, so if you go out this door and go left, and then you kind of go down the pathway. You're going to see a big gym down there. We have our chili cook-off. If you're new with us today, join us. It's going to be a fun time. Um, and all the donations go to the youth group, mainly for summer camp scholarships. Um, but there was a miracle this week at the Alvin household. As I told you last week, um, my, my daughter said, hey, Dad, I'm making my own chili. And um, so we're basically competing against each other. I'm like, Harper, we got to unite as a team Alvin. And she reluctantly agreed. And so we only did one chili. Now, I'm not going to tell you what number to vote for. It's the number between five and seven, but I won't say anything more, okay? I'm joking. I have no idea what number it is. Um, but I do hope and, and, and pray that you come on down and, and join us down there for that. So let me pray, and then we will get into the message. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning and the time that we could come into your, God, to this, this building God, corporately worshiping you. Father, I pray that as we get into the words that we find in your infallible word for us, God, that we would be able to drop the stuff, drop the baggage. God, those worries that we carry with us all week, the stress that keeps us up at night. God, the, the things that, that you don't want us to hold on to, you want us to give them to you, God, for you freely take them from us, God, but we can hold so tightly. God, I pray that you would help us through the work in every Holy Spirit. Help us let that stuff go and focus in on these words that we are going to see Christ speak, the things we're going to see him do in the life of one man. God, I pray that you would take us deeper. God, not just in our heads, but God, in our hearts in our souls. Take us deeper to a place we've never been, to a place where we can see you in better ways, experience you in greater ways, fall in love with you even more. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If you've been here the last number of weeks, you know we've been in the Gospel of Mark, and today is our 10th week in the Gospel of Mark, and I hope you've been enjoying it. I know that I have. I've never been able to do a study through the, the gospel. I've done different passages, but I've been enjoying a couple of things. Number one is this. I've been enjoying seeing Jesus and growing in my relationship with him and my understanding of who he is, but I've also enjoyed this, seeing the progression of the disciples. I've never really thought about that, but seeing them kind of grow in their understanding of who Jesus is, and so I hope and I pray that you've been enjoying this series as well. What I want to start with is this, is a recap from last week, because it's going to help us understand part of what we're going to look at in today's passage. So you may remember, if you were here, we saw that Jesus, his true nature kind of comes out last week before his disciples. Jesus has been teaching all day on the Sea of Galilee. He's on a boat. He's back off the shore, and there could be hundreds, if not thousands, of people he's talking to, and he's teaching all day long and wonderful parables and great wisdom. And then he says to his disciples, he says, I'm tired. I want, I want, to, I want to be away from the crowd. Take me across the Sea of Galilee. His disciples say, okay, okay, let's get in the boat, and they do. Sometime during that evening, during the night, a massive storm, you may remember the word mega, a mega storm erupts, and the waves start crashing into the boat, and these disciples, they know they're at the wrong place at the wrong time, and they know this is seriously bad, and they start to panic, and they're afraid. Jesus, in the meantime, is asleep 
in the back of the boat, exhausted from teaching. They go and they wake him up, and Jesus, he gets up, he calms the storm, which terrifies the disciples even more. We looked at this last week, what can only be described as the otherness of Jesus. The absoluteness of Jesus. When he says to the wind and the waves, peace be still, and obeys It showed Jesus in this new light, something that the disciples could not imagine or even explain. What they saw was Jesus' holiness on full display, and it put the fear of God, the fear of the Lord in them. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pick up the passage the next morning. So right, so they, they cross over the sea, the wind and the waves come, it's calm, right, The next morning comes, and that's where we're going to pick up in Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. It states this. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, and do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly, Do not send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him, saying, Send us to the the pigs, Let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man the one who had had the legion sitting there, clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. And he was getting into the boat, ah, pardon me, as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled. I want to bring that map up so we can kind of again see where this is all taking place. The last number of weeks we've seen Jesus on the west side of the sea of Galilee. That's where he's going to spend most of his time. That's where most of the people are. Again, the night before, Jesus, he's down here somewhere along the sea, and he says, let's go to the other side. Now, we know that he gets to the other side because it says in the end, and we'll look at this more here in a moment, that the man begins to speak about what Jesus had done in the Decapolis. Now, the Decapolis is not a city. It's not part of a city. It's an actual region around the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. Can we bring that other map up, please? The purple is the Decapolis. There's ten cities. Nine of them are on the east bank of the Jordan, and one is right up in here just to the west bank of the Jordan on the southern part of the Sea of Galilee. Now, I'm not going to try to pronounce their names, but they are there. Trust me, I tried, and wasn't going to happen this week. Before we actually get into the passage, I do want to ask this question to get our minds going. Who has heard this from a pastor or a Sunday school teacher? That if if you were the only person 
alive, Jesus would have died for you. Anybody ever heard that statement before? Okay, a number of you, right? When I put my faith and trust in Jesus, I was 16 years old. That's the time he made me new in him. And a couple of years later, I was in Sunday school. I had wonderful Sunday school teachers, Norm and Sue Hillstrom, loved them dearly. And they said this, and it made my mind think, like, is that true? If I was the only person on earth, which is odd to think about, would that have really happened, right? And I get it's a hypothetical statement, but it makes us think of the the magnitude of the love of God. It makes us think that the lengths at which Jesus has gone for us, and not only that, but it answers a question that we all have. Does God care about me? Not, not, Not the masses. Does God care about me personally, individually? Does God just, just does, he, does he think of me? Does he care about me? The answer is absolutely yes. And we're going to see one of those moments that this morning where, yeah, Jesus loves the masses, but Jesus also loves the one. Jesus seeks out the one. Jesus loves the one. So let's read this. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 5 again. And they came, Jesus and the disciples came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the garrison. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with chains. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but, the, but he wrenched the chains apart and broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the mountains, he was always crying and cutting himself with stones. Over the past 10 weeks, we've kind of glanced over this idea of clean spirits and Jesus taking care of them. We've never really hit on them because I knew we would be talking about them today. There's a lot to that subject, to demon possession, to demons themselves. What I want to focus on this morning is this, though, the hopelessness of this man, this this man who is possessed. And the first thing we need to see is that word unclean is not coincidental. There's a reason that Mark puts in here that is a man with an unclean spirit. It's not that he's just unclean because he's possessed. That's the first reason. The second reason is this. There's actually four. The second is this, that he lived among the tombs and among the dead, which is a huge issue in regards to the Jewish faith. If you look at the Old Testament, if you were to even touch a dead body, you would have to go through days of purification just to be considered, quote, clean, unquote, again. So this man living among the bodies of the dead is bad. In fact, by the time Jesus comes around, the the religious leaders had kind of packed on more regulations so you didn't have to just be, you didn't have to just touch a dead body, you just had to be around them. So this is big time issue. The third reason that he's considered unclean is because he is a Gentile. I mean, the Jews barely like themselves, right? They definitely don't like Gentiles. And so to be a Gentile, you are unclean. And the fourth reason he's considered unclean is this, is because he lives around pigs. Pigs are considered an unclean animal, and therefore this man, again, is unclean. So this guy has like the quadruple whammy going on against him. And I can't imagine the torment that he's under day and night, possessed and living like this. And again, the reality is hopeless. No one can help him. People have tried. People have gone up there to try to bind him so he can't cut himself. Chains don't work. Shackles don't work. Nothing has worked on this guy. And how long has he been at this? How long has he been possessed? Weeks, months, or maybe years? He's obviously someone's son. He might be someone's husband. He could be someone's dad. Of course, he's a friend to some. And to see him like this in this state, it's hopeless. Living amongst the mountains amongst the tombs, crying out and cutting himself day and night for how long we don't know. But then Jesus, 
And friends, Jesus changes everything. Look at verse 6. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. We don't know if it's the man running or the demons running because they recognize Jesus. We do know this, that the unclean spirits, they, they speak up next. Verses 7 through 11, or 7 through 8, Paul, I apologize. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying, Jesus was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. We need to take a moment and look at this. Again, we have not focused on demons, but demons know who Jesus is. Satan knows who Jesus is. These, demon knows, these demons know where Jesus comes from, and notice the title that is given, Jesus, Son of the Most High God. That, again, is not a coincidence that these, tithe, that these demons give Jesus this title. It's extremely descriptive. The, the term, Most High God, if you were to look at the Old Testament, the meaning of that, it means the sovereignty of God. It means the absoluteness of just one God. And notice, notice who is saying this. It's not a Jew, it's a Gentile. We know he's a Gentile because he lives near the Decapolis. This man would have grown up in a culture where there would have been multiple gods, the idea of polytheism. The god of the moon, the god of the stars, the god of the, the sun, the, the land, the rivers, the rocks. In my research this week, I actually read this, I found it fascinating that Years ago, when sociologists began to study different religions around the world, these polytheistic religions, they noticed one common thing that ran through them. It was this, is that even though they had different gods, a god of the moon, a god of the sun, a god of the, the stars or whatnot, there was always one. There was always one God that was above them all. He was unknowable. He might be the God that's over the, the, the mountains or the God that's beyond the sea. But this one God who was not known transcend all the other gods. We actually looked at this at the end of last week. That the idea that the God of the Bible could not be made up. Because never in human history has someone made up a God that's more terrifying than the thing that you want to control. They would never make up a God that's better, that's bigger than the sun or more terrifying than the wind and the waves. And that that's what we see in Jesus. And so when these demons give Jesus this title, that's exactly what they're stating. He is bigger than it all. He is mightier than it all. Friends, we did this last week. Imagine you're one of the disciples. Put yourself in their shoes. Jesus is teaching all day. He says, take me across, and you do, and you begin to paddle. All of a sudden, the wind comes up and gets harder and more and more and more and stronger, and all of a sudden, the, the storm is right on top of you, and you're terrified. Jesus wakes up, and he calms the wind and the waves. And remember what we said? It became mega peace, mega calm. After a few minutes, there's not even a ripple on the Sea of Galilee. And we know that the disciples said this. They were filled with great fear, and they said to one another, Who then is this? Who is this man that even the wind and the sea obey him? Again, put yourself in their shoes. You're still in the boat after this happens. You're in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. You still have to get to the other side. And so you keep rowing and rowing, and your entire time across, you're thinking, Who's this guy? You're terrified. Who is, this, who is this man that can have this power? I can't imagine the sigh of relief when their boat finally hits the shore, right? Finally land. But that question, who is this man, is still in the back of your mind. And not a day goes by that the answer does not come. You see this possessed man, he walks up, or I should say, he runs up. And these words come out of his mouth, and you're sitting right there with Jesus. This guy says, I know who you are, Jesus, son of the most high God. And all of a sudden, it clicks. Who is this man? This is God in the flesh. Jesus, son of the most high God, standing right next to you. 
Imagine for a moment. I can just see their eyes just getting wide. Their minds going. The puzzle pieces getting put into place. Who is this man? He is God in the flesh. Jesus, however, does not miss a beat. He knows who he is. With the disciples standing around him, I can, Jesus says this, and he, verse 9, and Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. It seems as though the demons are playing their last card they have in their pocket. A Roman legion is about 6,000 men. Now, this does not mean that there's 6,000 demons living in this guy. It means there's a lot. And even though the, the demons know that Jesus is the Lord and Lord and the King of kings, he's the son of the Most High God, they're still trying to intimidate him, so they play that card on the table. But it does not work. Look at verses 10 through 13. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them what? Permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. I've heard that some question, why does Jesus allow this, right? 2,000 pigs, that's a lot of pigs. I mean, is Jesus against pigs? I mean, he's Jewish, so he's not eating pigs, right? That's against the law, but he's also God, so I'm sure he knows how delicious bacon is, right? hear that amen but here's the thing friends here's how we have to look at this it's one man versus 2,000 pigs Jesus he could have said you're done I'll cast you back into hell where you belong he has the power to do so but he doesn't why there are differing ideas on this but here's where I land if we were to read Matthew which we're going to the book of Matthew, chapter 8, verse 30, we're going to get a different viewpoint of this exact same event. And Matthew adds something. He says this, Matthew eight thirty, And behold, they cried out, the demons cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come to torment us, right here it is, before the time, question mark. Those three words, before the time, are revealing. It seems as though the demons know that there is something to come that their time is limited on the earth and they're going to do everything they can to create havoc as much as possible. Jesus, he also knows his time has not come. The pinnacle of his ministry is still a number of years out. The pinnacle being his death and resurrection. And Jesus also knows this, that on the cross, he is going to crush these demons. He is going to crush Satan himself. And we know that according to Colossians Chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, it says this. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And here it is. He disarmed at the same time he disarmed the rulers and authorities, that's the demonic rulers and authorities, and put them to what? Open shame. By triumphing over them in him. Meaning this, triumphing over them in him, that is the day of the work that was done on the cross. So Jesus stands there before this, this man that's possessed he stands there, he knows the day is coming, but it's not yet come. I'll wait. Go into the, the pigs. The bigger point is this, friends, that a man is worth more than 2,000 pigs. That one man is worth more than all the pigs. That one man's worth more than all the animals. And why is one man worth more and all the pigs and all the animals and everything else, because that man is made in the image of God, and that man, therefore, has value. You have value because you are made in the image 
of God as well. Now I understand that there's a monetary value in these pigs, but that does not negate the fact that this one man is important to Jesus. This one man matters to Jesus. And so when Jesus says to him that, that those demons, go ahead and go, what he is doing, he is releasing those chains that have bound that man so tight for so many years. Remember, no one could help him. No one could subdue him. The chains could not bind him. He's roaming day and night, crying out and cutting himself. But then Jesus, and with the word comes freedom. Friends, Jesus can do that in your life as well. Jesus can take those chains, that sin that binds you, and free you as well. And here's the wonderful thing. When Jesus frees us, it's one and done. We can choose to pick up our chains and try to put them back on, but you know what? They don't latch. They don't latch anymore. They have no power over us. Jesus is one and done. His grace is sufficient for all. And if you have not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I can tell you this. You still have chains on, but Jesus is big enough to break those. And if that is you, and you want freedom, just like this man has freedom, I'm going to encourage you to believe in Christ. Believe that he is the Son of God. Believe that he took your sin. Believe that he died, and three days later, he left that sin there and rose again to redeem you, to give you freedom. Believe in that. Doesn't say you got to read the Bible. Doesn't say you got to come to church. Doesn't say any of that stuff. It says believe and confess that Jesus is Lord. And if that's you, come find me after this. Come find me. I'd love to talk more about you, or more about, uh, more talk more with you about what it looks like to follow after Jesus. These pigs dying in the sea, though, are going to get people's attention. Let's get back to the text. Let's look at the response of the people, verses fourteen through seventeen. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion sitting among, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and the pigs. What's the people's response? Fear. Instead of joy, joy for their friend, joy for their, their brother, joy for their, their, their husband or their son, fear. Like the disciples in the storm. Who is this man that is able to do this? Who is this man that is able to break this man free? And what do they begin to do? Beg him to leave. Why? Some people believe because the people thought that Jesus would cost them more money. There are some believe that the people begged him to leave because they thought Jesus would disrupt their life even more. Here's where I land, friends. I think this. There are many people who know the power of Jesus, who have seen it, and yet they still reject Jesus. They've seen it, and they still say, no, they still say, Jesus, keep your distance. Come only so close. Why? Because they and we many times choose to live in our sin. I've said this before and I'll say it again. Everyone loves teacher Jesus. That's such great wisdom, Jesus. I'll apply that to my life. Everyone loves healer Jesus, right? Everyone loves healer Jesus. Jesus, thank you so much for healing me from whatever afflicted me. But when it comes all too real, when Jesus shows his true power, the hand goes up. Why? Because in that moment, when we truly see Jesus, there's a choice that has to be made. Not only will we make him Savior, will we make him Lord. And there's a difference. There is a big difference in that. Jesus, not just a good teacher, not just a wise man, Lord, meaning this. He is ruler of how we live. 
He's ruler of how we act. He's ruler of our lives, how we spend our money, how we spend our time, what we watch, what we do, where we go. I mean, imagine for a moment these people are like, Jesus, thank you so much for, for healing Bob. Thank you. Come live among us. That would have been a great, great passage. The people's lives change, but they don't. Why? Because if they invite Jesus in, they have to make him Lord. They have to begin to obey his ways. How often, friends, do we do the same? It might not be a complete rejection, but it might be a Jesus, you know what? I'm going to listen to you in regards to what I, what I listen to. I'll, I'll, I'll listen to you on that one and what I watch. But when it comes to spending my money, here's the arm. Stay so far away. Or how about Jesus? You know, you can tell me what to do with my money, but I'm, I'm not going to listen to you in regards to um, the people that I hang out with, people that kind of bring me down. I'll, I'll listen to everything else, but that one, keep your distance. It's all or nothing, friends. Jesus is not just Savior, he has to be Lord. People beg him to leave, and Jesus does, verses, verses 18 through 20. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed, let me say that again, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. I want to end with this. There are three times a request comes to Jesus in this passage. Two of them Jesus grants, one he does not. Here's the thing. It's opposite of what we think should happen. The first request is the demons. Jesus, send us into the pigs. Jesus says, okay, go. The second one is the people say, Jesus, leave our region. We don't want you here. Jesus says, okay, I'm backing off. The third one, the man that has been possessed, that was possessed, comes to Jesus and says, I want to follow after you. What does Jesus say? No. You would think Jesus would be like, yeah, come on, let's go. Be part of the posse. No. Why? Jesus has a mission for him. This is the first time we see the gospel, at least in the gospel of Mark. The first time we see the gospel enter into a Gentile area. Jesus says, go. Tell your friends. Tell your friends what the Lord has done. Tell your friends how much mercy he's shown you. Tell your friends, the people you haven't seen in a long time, that knew you were up here, that knew you were over here, that knew you were possessed. Go tell them how much bigger I am, how much power I have, how good I am in your life. Friends, we have the exact same mission it hasn't changed. So often we think, well, if we want to do an evangelist, evangelist thing, we need to have tracks, right? And we need to have little Bibles, and we need to have the Romans road, right? We need to know that we're all sinners, and we're all sin leads to death, and everything else. Those aren't bad. Those are wonderful things. But here's the thing that's even better. My testimony. Your testimony. Here's what God's done. Here's how good God's in my life. Here's the mercy God's shown me. Here's how God got me through this. Here's how God broke these chains of addiction. Here's how God took me from point A in death to life found in him. Here is who Jesus Christ is. That is our mission. You don't need anything else except what God has done in your life. Let us be the church that does that. Let us be the church that just talks to people normally we don't got to throw a track at them. Those aren't bad. Again, I'm not saying that. But let us be the church that just has normal conversations with people that don't know Jesus and say, hey, I know who my God is. Let me tell you how good he's been to me. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for it this morning and this time again. God, thank you for this passage that we have of you setting this man, this hopeless man free, God, and how you give him this mission to go and tell others Go and tell the world, Lord, how wonderful you are. God, I want to pray for this church, Lord God, that as we continue to move forward, God, you would put those times in our lives where we can just tell others about you, about what you are doing in our lives, our story, God. It doesn't end with salvation. God, it begins 
God, keep writing in that book of our hearts, writing in that book of our lives. And God, let us proclaim the name of Jesus wherever we go. In Christ's name, amen.